Collins Last Stand merchandise has finally arrived. I've partnered with Declaration Clothing to bring you high quality shirts, stickers, and even a poster, all proudly made right here in the United States. If you're interested in checking out my wares and supporting independent ad free political and historical content like CLS, please head on over to Declaration Clothing at declarationclothing.com. And yes, I know I look damn good. Now, on with the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Colin's Last Stand right here on YouTube. My name is Colin Moriarty. As always, I hope this video finds you and yours very well. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the Democratic Party in the United States. I haven't done a video on the Democrats in a while, and things are looking pretty good for the Democrats, especially after this recent election in places like New Jersey and Virginia. The Democrats might just be on the upswing. So I want to talk a little bit about their current prospects, what the field is looking like, and also kind of throw into the mix this poll that came out that indicates that they're actually weaker than they've been since Bill Clinton was elected and what that might mean for them. The Democrats have every chance to spring and strike right now, but they have to get their house in order first. That's what this video is about. We're a year removed from the day, almost to the date, that Donald Trump shocked the world in what is easily the greatest upset in modern American presidential history and quite possibly in the entirety of American presidential history. But with eyes focused most keenly on the 2018 midterms and even on the 2020 general election, many people got lost in the weeds and forgot that there would be an important series of off-cycle elections all over the U.S., including in Democratic strongholds like New Jersey and New York City, electoral bellwether Virginia, and in safely red Utah. In the unsurprising results that rolled in from these elections, as well as in other places around the states, we can begin to glean the fortunes of the Democratic Party moving forward to 2018 and beyond. Because while what happened on November 7th represents a poignant chink in the armor of Republican control of government, 2018 represents far more than that, a possible, albeit unlikely, beheading, as it were. It's no surprise that New Jersey swung back to the Democrats after eight years of Republican executive rule at the hands of Chris Christie, a man who once seemed all but destined for a successful presidential bid, only to be undone by scandals, not to mention his seemingly uncontrollable bluster and temper. His party was unceremoniously and unsurprisingly unseated this week, as Kim Guadagno, his heir apparent, was defeated badly by Democrat Philip Murphy. And when I say badly, I mean badly. Murphy won by 13 points. That's a landslide, though one everyone saw coming. New Jersey identifies heavily Democratic even during the Christie years, and even when Christie was popular. Christie was a sign of the times. Murphy's win shows that, through it all, New Jersey remains blue. The more interesting race was a couple hundred miles south of New Jersey in Virginia. Virginia is still technically a swing state, but it's well on its way to being a reliably Democratic checkmark in future elections. Not so much because of the blue leanings of Richmond, Virginia Beach, and Norfolk, but because Northern Virginia, Alexandria, and other places that spill out from Washington, D.C., are full of government employees who would never vote against their self-interest at the teat of the state. As Washington, D.C. has thrived and remained economically sound regardless of what's going on in the real world, so too has Northern Virginia, one of the wealthiest places in the United States. This change has been slow and methodical. Virginia once was red, then leaned red, then became a swing state, and now it is what it is. People kept an eye on this race, though, because lost in the chaos of the 2016 electoral map was that while Virginia went for Hillary Clinton, it was way, way, way closer than anyone thought it would be. Clinton was supposed to win Virginia by perhaps 10 points. She barely ended up winning it at all. If anyone took that as a sign that Virginia would be moving in a different direction, though, well, they were wrong. Ed Gillespie was a weak GOP candidate. Democratic candidate Ralph Northam beat him easily. And as recent history shows, Virginia is very comfortable electing Democratic governors. These two wins, one not all that shocking, the other a reinforcement of inexorable trends, portend well for Democrats moving into the all-important 2018 midterm, giving the struggling party something to work off of after not only the historic embarrassment of 2016, but the stacked losses in random, one-off special House of Representative elections, of which they lost pretty much every competitive seat. These victories could very well be the beginning of a resurgence for the party, so long as the party plays its cards right, and so long as it avoids many obvious pitfalls along the way. They are, after all, working against what many see as nothing short of a supervillain. But there's a random set of data that complicates all of these good feelings, something buried because of the off-cycle election. The Democratic brand itself is currently in a major world of hurt, not only because of its catastrophic loss to a Trump-controlled GOP in 2016, but because of, well, lots of other very interesting reasons. CNN, in conjunction with research company SSRS, released polling that indicates that the Democratic Party, regardless of these isolated points of victory in an incredibly favorable electoral atmosphere, 
is weaker than it has been in decades. Barely more than one-third of Americans look at the Democrats favorably, but that number has shrunk since eight months ago, well after Donald Trump entered the Oval Office. 54% of Americans, more than half, don't have a favorable view of the Democratic Party, the lowest number since 1992. Then again, 1992 was a good year for Democrats. That's when Bill Clinton was elected. And 2020 is looking to shape up similarly, with the specter of a significant third-party candidate looming large, just like then. Third parties tend to, though not always, injure the conservative on the ticket, which is exactly what happened in 1992. So perhaps not all is as negative as it seems if you're a Democrat. Bush Sr. was a one-off in a sea of two-term presidents. Perhaps Trump will be too. What is concerning, however, is that this poll shows significant weakness in two core, completely essential Democratic voting blocks that they simply cannot win without. Voters who aren't white and young voters. A third of young voters don't look favorably on the Democratic Party. 48% of non-white voters don't look favorably on the party. The former number isn't catastrophic, but the latter number is very, very bad. But there's good news. The Republicans are struggling even more than the Democrats in favorability ratings, and in a generic nationwide congressional ballot, the Democrats are beating the Republicans by three times the margin of error. That data, combined with the fact that the party out of power traditionally does well to very well in midterm elections, bodes awesomely for the Democrats in 2018, particularly when using some big victories in 2017 as a springing off point. The idea now, if the Democrats want to win in 2018, is to remain disciplined and work towards incremental change, which is far more palatable to a majority of American voters. It's also important to cast off the chains of the past, something the GOP has done with mixed results, but something the Democrats seem completely incapable of. A year out, people are still debating Hillary Clinton's electoral loss, claiming she really won because she won the popular vote, talking about how old stalwarts like Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders are the way towards salvation in 2020. No one is willing to fully shoulder the blame for blowing it in 2016, including the candidate. And yes, I read her book, the entire thing. Hillary Clinton and her team got outworked, outplayed, and outhustled in every respect in 2016. They should be ashamed. Not a single high-ranking staffer that worked for Clinton on that election should be allowed within 100 miles of a presidential campaign ever again. Enough already. If you want a different result, you need to try different things. Try new things. Try new people. New candidates. New staffers. New techniques. Anything that so much as smells like the Clinton campaign is going to contribute to a loss. Joe Biden left everyone at the altar, albeit understandably since he was suffering from the pain of losing his son. Biden would have beat Clinton in the primaries and beaten Trump too, but he didn't. His window is shut. Bernie Sanders? It's true that a tenth of his voter base pulled the trigger for Trump in the general election, not to mention Sanders himself, who selfishly stayed in the race and refused to immediately endorse Clinton. But we're talking about a socialist who never even saw a small fraction of the deluge he'd face in opposition research alone if he had beaten Clinton, which would have buried him. It's time to be realistic and not put forth the man with the broken calculator. I say all of this not to get ahead of ourselves. 2020 is far, far away, and we all need to survive the midterms first. But because it's time for Democrats to really start getting their heads in the game. 2018 won't be easy. The entire House of Representatives will be up, but the GOP majority in the House will likely take several cycles to erode, and that assumes the GOP doesn't turn things around on its own before that ever happens. Meanwhile, the Senate map in 2018 is incredibly unfriendly. Remember, everyone up for election in the Senate in 2018 was elected alongside Barack Obama in 2012, and some of those senators are protecting seats in red states. The situation will be very different. The GOP is raising lots of money. Trump's voting bloc, while small, is loyal. And as 2016 showed us, Trump absolutely has a secret and silent group of voters who will support him and his candidates. 2018 is going to get complicated. Blowing it can, in turn, blow 2020 to smithereens. There's a lot at stake here if you're a Democrat. So yes, the Democrats scored some great victories in November of 2017's elections. They too are raising money. They have some exciting candidates making the rounds, some interesting ideas that appeal to the wider American public, and they happen to be working against a chronically unpopular president, House and Senate, all allied to the opposition party. It's a perfect situation. Everything should be working in their favor. Some would say everything is working in their favor. My question for the great self-saboteurs of the Democratic Party, however, is if they can get out of their own way long enough to score victories when and where it really counts, or if we'll be having a similar conversation a year from now. Well, that's it for this episode of Collins Last Stand. I will be very curious to see what you think of this one, because we don't talk Democratic and Republican politics too much on this show at least compared to other topics, broader topics, historical topics, broader political topics. And I think now is really the time to start focusing on what's going to happen in 2018 and beyond on the show. So let me know what you think. Leave a comment below if you'd like. Thumb up the video if you liked it. Thumb it down if you don't. Please share it with friends and family. 
and share with them the majesty, the might, and the wonder of Colin's Last Stand. Again, I hope you and yours are doing great. I will see you for the next episode of Colin's Last Stand. Until then, keep on learning. Thank you.